Earlier this year, a number of us ended up in a small island in the Pacific. <laughs> and three days, three nights. Mm -hmm. Supposed to be a three hour joke at that one. A little bit longer than that. But um, uh, many of you received a syllabus uh, from the Exodus class that we did there. And I added this in the back of the syllabus. So I know you probably haven't looked at it. So I thought I would cover it here. Uh, so thank you, Andrew and David, for allowing me to have the privilege of addressing. I've watched from afar. By the way, hi. My wife is watching. Hi, Joan. Hi, Joan. Hi, Joan. Hi, Joan. Hi, Joan. Mom. I think she's watching. She's probably falling asleep. Shut it off as soon as I get home. Oh, nothing important now. <laughs> Not those same jokes again. Jeez. All right. But anyway. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out was that, uh, let's go to Exodus chapter 3 in the, in the Bible, and we want to look at different ways God communicated with Moses and the children of Israel. So, I mean, we have a written word, and God communicates very mightily through the written word. And as long as you open it and read it, spend a little bit of time meditating on it and then doing something with it, this is always available. Now, the libraries in ancient Egypt didn't have a Bible yet. Uh, they hadn't, it hadn't been written yet. So they didn't have that privilege. So there was a lot of different ways that God communicated with Moses and with the children of Israel. We're just going to look at a few of them because the end result is going to be if God needs to get something across to us, if it's Joyce Meyer or somebody to answer the question, to make sure that we understand and the prayer is answered and all that, God will make sure we get it. Because many times when we, ask, when we ask in prayer, God goes to work. We don't see behind the scenes. Any of you familiar with the record of Balaam? Yes. Okay, well, the children of Israel had no clue that was going on behind the scenes. That there, there's a whole thing going on where Balaam was going to pay, pay a lucrative amount of money to curse them. They didn't know anything about it, but God immediately went to work to stop that from happening. So when we make a request made known unto God, He goes to work. He's listening. And you know what He does? And sometimes He doesn't. Because He knows better and He knows best. And sometimes it's just, hang on there. If it's going to be four years, it's going to be 40 years. It's okay. Um, I had four places that, uh, that I've been praying about to come teach this year, and I've picked three of the four. So. <laughs> The last one's in Mexico City, but my Spanish is really weak. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I'll be talking with Edgar again here on, on that one. But um, so God does answer prayer. Now here, look at Exodus 3. We'll start there. All right. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, who was a priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the dark side of the moon. And he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, this is before gas logs. All right, we're, you know, you're, you, all right, we're in California. I know it's a little warm here. It was 16 degrees this morning when I woke up in Colorado and headed here. So I'm real happy it was nice and warm here today. <laughs> that was really nice. But it was nice when we took off and beautiful snow all over the place. It's not normal. Uh, normally it's warmer than that. But um, the thing is, is that they had fissures in that part of the country where basically natural gas would come out. And it would be underneath a bush, and it was burning. Now, it's not that God's a chemist, uh, you know, and all of that, but He <laughs> does work within the about with with the the um, uh, the rudiments of the world, as it says in Colossians and King James, with the elements uh, of the elements that He put here, and He can utilize them. He's a great physicist, after all, and He can utilize certain things like that. So here's a bush; it's burning, and it's not being burnt up. Now, I'd love to have the patent on that, yeah. uh, you, know? Yeah. you know, but that would be really good. So, that's one of the first ways. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire. How many of you have seen this outside of the Charlton Heston movie? Yeah. Yeah. I saw it in the Disney movie. Oh, that one works too, yeah. <laughs> All right, and so Moses scratches his head in verse 3, and he says, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God has moved. God has got a burning bush that's not being consumed. God has moved in Jesus Christ. He's allowed us to get born again. And 
Christ finished the work. Uh, we accept what he did. Then God can go to work in our lives helping each and every one of us out. But we had to take that intermediate step. We had to be like Moses. Hmm, what's going on over here with this bush? <laughs> so he went and saw. He got, you know, he shut the television off, shut his cell phone off, walked up to the burning bush, and said, hmm, I'm going to check this out. Verse 4, and then when the Lord saw, he turned aside to see. Then God called to him out of the midst of the bush. That would be like walking to your car in the morning, and God's talking to you out of your car. Okay? That would be a different word than that. You run the car. Oh, no, you do it. But uh, that was one of those things where that's kind of what it would be like today. He's walking over and there's a voice coming out of a car. Now, if you're at the Stanley Hotel in northern Colorado, all right, how many of you know that reference? Yeah. Okay, Marie would know that one. Okay, good. All right, that's where they filmed The Shining. <laughs> <laughs> so they had lots of voices there. We're not talking about them. Okay, we don't want those kind of voices. All right. But that's the point. Here's a burning bush, a voice is coming out of the bush. Moses, Moses, here am I, Lord, what do you need me to do? You know, take off your shoes. Place where he stands, holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father. Well, his father was Amram, uh, and he helped to save him his life when he was a little tot, about three months old. Uh, I am the God of thy father. I'm also the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses finally realized he was talking to God, and God was talking to him. He didn't have, he was receive, he's going to receive the Spirit at this time here. If he had the Spirit the whole time, why would God have to introduce himself to him here again? He did. So he's receiving the Spirit, and Moses hid his face, and he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in San Diego, and I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, and for I know their sorrows. Well, you can take a lot of this personally. The God of the Old Testament is, you know, the God of the New Testament. And Jesus Christ forged out a better testament. The word testament means covenant, agreement. And Christ, he got us a much better deal with God than they had in the Old Testament. Get heavy on the grace, heavy on the mercy, heavy on the forgiveness, and you guys can take it from there. Right? Okay. So here we go. The Lord said, I know my people's sorrows, and I'm going to answer their sorrows. I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And I'm going to bring them out of the land into a good land, a large land, unto a land flowing. It used to be with beer and pizza. <laughs> you know? But since we're in a health craze now, I guess it's got to be something like yogurt and wheat germ or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? <laughs> under the place. Of, under the place. Oh, I, said beef and kombucha. Oh, that works? <laughs> So, all right, it's a, such a great land that Canaanites live there, Hittites live there, Amorites live there, Parasites live there, Hivites live there, Termites live there, Jebusites live there. There's all kinds of ites. Seven nations are living in this land that I'm going to give you. That's a pretty good land. All right? Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh. And I can see Moses nodding all along with, yep, yep, yep. Now, I'm going to send you. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're, wait, 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 I didn't sign up for, what? Me? Hmm. <laughs> hey, have we signed up for our unique parts in the body of Christ? Yeah, we have. We've made Jesus Christ Lord, got the Spirit of God. Now it's a matter of what is your unique part in the body of Christ today? What is it that God needs you to do today as he sets you up in store until the sun comes back for you? Because there's something you may be doing today, learning how to do today, that you'll be doing for a while in the body of Christ. Or maybe it will change. You'll go to Kansas City or something. Great things always keep happening. <laughs> well, so, here we go. we got a land of ice. It's wonderful. And now, Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Do we have any volunteers to take Moses' place? Because God's not going to tell him that he's going to be with him for 40 years. He's just going to tell him all the good details. Here. He's just going to lay this out a little bit. And I, I'm going to send you. And Moses said unto God, uh, excuse me? Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, that I should be forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, well, certainly I'll be with thee. That was reassuring. And this will be the token unto thee that I have sent thee. 
when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you're going to come back to this mountain and you're going to serve me here at this mountain. And then Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, I'm on a mission from God. So either he's a blues brother or he's really a mission from God. Right? Because that's what God, I, you know, I don't know if that's ever happened here. Somebody just showed up and said, I'm on a mission from God, uh, and I'm coming to deliver you. And your answer would be, yeah, right. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they're going to say to me, What is his name? Do you have any pictures of him? Any, you know? Do you have any autographs? You know, how do we know you really come from God? There's a lot of people that claim they come from God. They're all over the world today. And God has sent them on a specific mission. Now, you can look at the results of some of those missions, and they're not really from the true God, are they? But that's a great question. Now, here's what God says unto him. And you know it's important because it's in all caps in the King James. I am that I am. Okay, it doesn't mean anything really. They, what that really means is I will become what I'll become. Whatever you need me to be, I will be for you to do what I'm asking you to do. Well, has God asked us to do certain things for him? Sure, he has. He's got the ministry of reconciliation. He didn't give it to the angels. He gave it to us. So is, if we don't speak, who's going to speak? You, you put in a whole lot of things that don't speak very well. So those who know the accuracy of God's word, it's good that we speak. It's a wonderful thing. But that's the point. God's saying, I am that I am. I will become what I need to become. Whatever you want me to do, I will do for you. Has God kind of given us that kind of an open-ended prayer, too? Yeah. Absolutely. We can ask for anything, but we've got one stipulation. According to my word, according to my will, according to that's the stipulation. Mm -hmm. So we better know something about the books. So we can ask for, for, you know, properly about all that. So, now, the question is, did God keep his part? He's saying, whatever you need me to be, I will be. I will take care of you. Thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, I am that sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all the generations. And then they kind of go back and forth a little bit, finally Moses decides to go. First off, God honored free will. He got Moses' attention, and Moses has decided to check it out. Then God said, I have a mission for you. You don't have to go, but I don't have any big fish to swallow you like I do for John. <laughs> you know, because a lot of times when God wants us to do certain things, like move to Boise, that, you know, it's a wonderful thing. As long as God is there, and it's the true God telling us these things. That's the whole point with a lot of this, and that's the whole thing here. So, now we go to chapter 4. I'm not saying he's not with yours, the whole situation. 4.10. Exodus 4.10. All right, now, Moses says unto the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent. I don't talk very well. Neither heretofore nor since, since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, for I am slow of speech and I have a thick tongue. That's what that say, he says there. Uh, I was reading Ernest Martin, and he, he, he said that he... The reason that Moses says is because it says in Acts he was, he was mighty in word and in deed. So if he was mighty in word and deed, he could speak. But uh, Ernest Martin makes the point that maybe since he was raised in, uh, in, um, in the courts of Egypt, that he spoke with an Egyptian accent, which I had never considered before. And I thought that was kind of interesting. I don't know if that's the truth or not, but I think it's more like I just, I just can't do crossword puzzles. <laughs> you know, I'm just not real eloquent. But he was, you know, he's got 80 years of life behind him, 40 years in the greatest education in Egypt, 40 years checking the desert out, getting prepared for two and a half million people. Of course, God's not telling him what was going to happen. That part of it. But he says, oh, you're coming back to the mountain, and I'll take care of you. So that, that, that's kind of intriguing about that Egyptian accent, because if you are being um, in bondage by, Egypt, by the people in Egypt, and the guy shows up with an Egyptian accent, that, you know, not quite as, you, you can see how, I can see that, that could add something to it. All right, so, look at verse 14, 414, 
And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And so God threw a dart at him. No. <laughs> God just said, oh, excuse me, but you know Aaron, the Levite, he's your brother? I know he can speak well. He never shuts up. <laughs> you know, I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he comes forth to meet thee. And when he sees thee, he'll be glad in his heart. I always wondered how Aaron could get, they're slaves, right, in Egypt? And this guy just, this, he's 83 years old, and he can just disappear and, you know, come all the way across to, you know, the Saudi Arabia from Egypt uh, without any problems and meet up with Eric, I mean, meet up with Moses and then come back. But here's God's answer to the situation. Moses is saying, I don't talk very well, I'm not eloquent. Hey, Aaron does. And it also worked out real well because he got an audience with the leaders of, of uh, Israel real fast. As soon as he got back there, he got all the elders together and says, here's my brother Moses. God's been talking to him. Listen to him. So it's better than him just wandering in town, coming in with a banjo or something, saying, I'm on a mission from God. <laughs> <laughs> you know? All right. We know Aaron can talk. Now, now, verse 15. Here's another way. God is handling this particular shortcoming in Moses' mind. All right, verse 15. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to thee, instead of a mouth. Thou shalt be to him instead of God. And thou shalt take this rod in thy hand, wherewith thou shalt do miracles, signs, miracles, and wonders. So basically, God's saying, here's how we're going to do it. You'll tell him what to speak, he'll speak for you. But doesn't that always give you a little more intrigue, too, when you, you kind of whisper in a guy's ear or pull him aside and talk to him when he steps up and does his whole presentation? <laughs> That's a little bit of extra mystery there. Yeah, I'm fine, I, got I don't know if it's a Marvel comic guy or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, let's go to chapter 7. So that's another way God answered a prayer. Moses is trying to talk his way out of what his way out of this. But God's going, nope, sorry. <laughs> Got that answer. Got this answer. He was the most prepared person of all time to do something like that, with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, all the prophets are compared to Moses. Even Jesus Christ was compared to Moses. So 7-1, and the Lord said unto Moses, see? I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. So that's following out, and that's how they were able to deal with Pharaoh. Verse 6, 7, 6. And Moses and Aaron, look at this, they did as the Lord commanded them. That's a novel idea. They did what God commanded them to do. And Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron was 83 years old when they came on to Pharaoh. So age lack of hair, can't use any of that as excuses. All right. Chapter 6. Oh, we have to go back. Yeah, we're in 7. Go back to 6. 6-1. Six, and 2. Here is a, a great example, because we were checking to see if God kept his promises to Moses to do whatever it is Moses needed him to do. 6-1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. For with strong hand shall he let you go. And with a strong hand shall he drive them out of this land. And God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. He spoke directly to Moses. Out of a burning bush earlier, now he's speaking directly to Moses. Now, I'm getting an audible voice is cool, but what's even better is understanding the spirit of God that's born within us and how God who is spirit talks to our spirit, our spirit talks to our mind, and then we act. We act. We heard manifestations. That's how you manifest. Speaking in terms of interpretation and prophecy. God's spirit, your spirit. Words come out as you speak, as you act. So many times. All right. Hold your exodus here. Go to Philippians 2. This was going to be the last verse, but we'll look at it now. Well, I still get half of you away. <laughs> right. Philippians 2. Philippians 2.13. Well, you guys with the phones have to wait for the last verse, don't you? Oh, okay, that's good. See, so it used to be you'd say the book, give people time to get to the end of the chapter, because you want them to read ahead, then you go to the verse. But you guys can't do that. So, uh, <laughs> All right, Philippians 2.13. For it is God which works in you, both the will and the do of his good pleasure. 
That's that God in Christ in you. God working in you. Inspired utterance. Inspired action. Different things that you do because God just works within you. That's wonderful. Let's go back to Exodus. But that's the point. God worketh in you. God by the Holy Spirit today. God who is spirit. Spirit in you. You don't have to have an audible voice. You know when God's talking to you. God talks to you in ways that you know. A lot of times we want God to give us a certain answer. And so we project in there. Look, God, are you talking to me? <laughs> God, I want this answer. And sometimes God has to tell us two or three or four ways. And sometimes he has to send Joyce Meyer to answer it to, for us or something. But that's, that's, he understands we're human. And that's the whole thing about Moses. Moses was just a man. I mean, he was a human. But he did his job very well. All right, so let's go to chapter 19. All right, Exodus 19. And verse 16, 19, 16. All right, so he's got them out. They're, out uh, they're at Mount Sinai in 1916. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. I mean, Quincy Jones was going to town. All right? <laughs> So that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. God, your people. Your people, your God. <laughs> and they stood at the nether part, down below the mount. And Mount Sinai, they looked up, and it was smoking. In fact, if you go there, the whole part, the, the rocks up there are all burnt on top of that hill. I've actually seen rock from there. Because God descended upon him. That whole mountain range, the whole top of it, is all burnt from where God descended upon it here. He descended upon it in a fire, and the smoke there ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by a voice. Now, it would really freak you guys out if I just called out to God, you know, and he called back with a voice here, an audible voice freak me out too. <laughs> but that's what Moses was doing. He got to want to introduce all these people to you. And what did the people do? Oh, we're excited. Nice to meet you. Shake hands with a big hand. That's the Monty Python routine with the hand come down. Yeah. So it, anyway, so what you have is, is God talking to his people and God brings in all the special effects. He goes, I want to show you guys something. I've got some power here. Uh, so Let's get started. And so then Moses said, welcome, God. And God spoke back to all the people. And the way the people are going to respond is typical people. All right, chapter 20. 20, uh, 18. 20, 18. Okay. And the people saw the thunderings. They saw the lightning. They heard the noise of the trumpet. They looked up and the mountains were smoking. And when the people saw it, they moved and stood afar off. <laughs> a little too much. <laughs> and they said unto Moses, All right, Moses, you speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not. God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces. But you said not. Psalm 119. Verse 1. But where have I hid my heart? They ran it sin against thee. That's what God's saying. He said, look, the people are going, excuse me, we're going to, uh, okay, Andy, you're a representative. You go talk to God, tell us what he has to say. I like it better, I don't have to trust Andy, because he lives in another state. I like it better that God can talk to me directly. He can talk to each one of us directly, because each of us has a cell phone. And it's got God's name on it, and God can communicate directly to each one of us now. Adam and Eve lost their cell phones in the garden. And God's been waiting to give us all a cell phone, a communication line, direct to him. Everybody's got one. We don't have to go, excuse me, Moses. All right, Josh, since you come here every month, you're going to be the guy. <laughs> you talk to God. Tell us what he has to say. Isn't that so much better today? Number one, we have the written word. And number two, God can talk to each one of us directly. Much better than having to stand out in the desert and listening or electing one person to go talk to God. Because... He's going to disappear for 40 days here. And we don't know if he's still alive or not. 
Well, build a golden calf while he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where are we in? We're in 20? Yes. All right, that's a wonderful thing. Let's go to uh, 24. Oh, wait a minute. Let's finish this one. This is 2018 again. Okay. So they decided, we're going to let Moses. And Moses said, nah, God's just out here talking with you. 21. And the people stood afar off. And Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. You know how you see these sci-fi things, the fog and all of that. If there, one bold person kind of, you know, slowly goes into the fog. And depending upon if it's a star or not, he either gets eaten right. So if he's an extra to Star Trek, right? You know, right away. Okay. So you know, you go right into the. You go right into the. He's going right into the thick darkness. Moses is. Here's this whole darkness. Here goes Moses into it. And all the people. Yeah, go ahead, Moses. Go ahead. <laughs> so. Uh, and the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shalt, uh, thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Okay, so there's the thing we're after. Another way God dealt with Moses, he just talked to him from heaven. He had never written a word yet. He had spirit upon him, but he was showing by an audible voice. Anybody ever hear of this guy, Jesus of Nazareth? Yes. It's amazing. The same thing happened to him. Look at John. John, uh, let's go to John 11. 41. John 11. 41. Okay. John 11, 41. Then they took away the stone. Oh, by the way, this guy's been dead for three days, four days. Last <laughs> uh, and they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. Isn't that how our prayer life should go? Have that kind of confidence? We know that God hears us once or twice. It doesn't say once or twice. Jesus died in Christ in us today. We can do the same works and greater works. I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Same type of stuff happening with Moses. When he had thus spoken, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And here comes the mummy. You know, he's wrapped like, like that. And so he comes forth. But why did he do why did he have to do all of that? Because the people needed to hear it. Okay, go to John 12. 1228. Alright, so he, he's talking about he's near the end of his life, the hour's coming, and then 28. He says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said it thundered. Others said, must have been an angel speaking to him. And Jesus said, the voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. And that's what Moses was trying to do. Moses had been talking to God. But the audible voice of the people to know that God was there. God was helping people. God was involved. Same thing here. Both these record with Jesus. I do this because others will know they can do it too. It's available for God. For us as humans to know God is listening and God can do something about it. Every one of our little prayers he listens to. And he, it helps that he knows what's best for us, and it helps that he knows the future, too. That helps, too. That all comes into play here. All right, meanwhile, back in Exodus 24, we're going to see another way that God talked to Moses. Exodus 24, 4. How are we doing? Good? Mm -hmm. right, Exodus 24, 4. Yeah. All right. Look at this novel idea. Exodus 24, 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. I wonder what he did with it. Hmm. Maybe he got translated into English. <laughs> Later on. 
Moses wrote the words of the Lord, and then he rose up early in the morning, and he built an altar under the hill, and 12 pillars, according to the 12 tribes of Israel, and he sent young men of the children of Israel. Uh, look at verse 7. And then he took the book of the covenant that God told him to write. He wrote it down, and he did a, he something else that was really novel. He read it in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do, and we'll be obedient. That's one of those you go, chuckle, chuckle. <laughs> we'll do whatever you want us to do, God. Oh, yeah, we'll be right there, whatever Moses, you tell Moses, we'll do it. Everything, everything. And unfortunately, we know the end of the story there. Because you know, they spent 40 years out in the desert because of their unbelief. But here it is. Here's a, I'm going to tell you the word, write it down, and then read it. To other people so they can hear it, understand it, and live it. And live it. The bottom part of it is to be able to live it. All right, Exodus 24, 12. 24, 12. What do we see here? And the Lord said unto Moses, Come on up unto the mount and be there. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. God's going to write God's, God's going to write on tablets of stone, and then Moses is supposed to take them down and read them to the people. I wonder what they called them. <laughs> it also says he wrote on both sides. Also, there's another place he held them both in one hand, so they're not these big, huge tablets that we see. You know, he even wrote them in, you know, in English. <laughs> but God said, I'll write on the stone, and you go down, take the stones down, and read them to everybody. That's, that's really, we're starting to see a whole variety of ways God is trying to get his word across to his people. All right, look at uh, 31, 18. 31, 18. And we see in 31, 18, guess what? He did what he said he was going to do in 31, 18. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with with him upon Mount Sinai, two tablets of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. So, God said he was going to give it to him, and God gave it to him. And then Moses took him down and threw him at, a, at the golden calf and broke him. <laughs> Alright, well, let's go back to 25. Exodus 25. Exodus 25, 21. Alright. Now, God is, uh, since they elected Moses as the only one to talk to God, God's going to say, all right, I'm going I'm to talk to you in the camp. I know you get tired of going up this mountain and coming back down again. And eventually, you got to go to the promised land. So here's what we're going to do. We'll build an ark, and we'll build a mercy seat. And here in the back here, 21, 25, 21, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark, so you got a box, which is really the ark, put the testimony, those Ten Commandments that we just talked about, put them in there, and then put above it, you got a couple cherubims that touch wings, and there's a mercy seat right there, and, and I will commune with you from off of that mercy seat. So wherever the ark is, I got a place that we can, we can talk back and forth, and everybody will know it. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So God's going to continue to give him commandments. He's going to continue to teach them to the people. And where will he go now? He doesn't have to climb the mount. Seven times he climbed the mount. Now he just has to go to the tabernacle and into the holy place. And there there will be this box and there will be a mercy seat. And God will come down in, in, you know, into the mercy, on top of the mercy seat. And Moses can come in and the two of them can have tea together. And I don't think coffee was invented back then, was it? Who's our dietitian? Is that coffee back then? <laughs> okay. Hebrews. Google. Hebrews. Oh, my God. Hebrews. <laughs> That's right. They were Hebrews, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. 33. Exodus 33. Exodus 33. Running through Exodus real quick here. 33.7. Let's start there. And Moses took the tabernacle because of the golden calf incident. 
and he pitched it without the camp, up far off from the camp. It used to be right in the heart of the camp. And in fact, Moses and Aaron had their place right in front of it, and you had the, Le the children of Levi, Kohath, uh, and the other two brothers were there, and then you had the different tribes, the tribe of Judah, of course, was right in front. They were all laid out that way, and now, because of the golden calf, he takes the tabernacle and says, I'm going to take my ball and go home. And that's what he did. He took the tabernacle and took it out and put it outside the camp. So if anybody genuinely wanted to talk to God now, they couldn't just go to the center of the camp. They got to go way out there in, let me see, what's a town north of here? Stockton. Okay, Tijuana. <laughs> okay, here's the point. Everybody was around it. It was in the middle, real easy. No, we're going to take it. We're going to put it way up here. Now, the traffic at times in San Diego, I understand, is not very good during rush hours. All right, well, if the tabernacle is way up here and you could enter the court with Thanksgiving, like it talks about in Psalm 100, this is the same type of thing. This is where you would go to pray to God. Well, if your tribe was way out here and he moved it way up over here, I know we're back in three days and we're going to talk to God. That's about what it would take. You got two and a half million people. You got to go. Uh, how many people in San Diego? Okay, that gives you an idea. Two, you got two and a half million people, and if you're you're way over here, you got to go all the way through the camp or all the way, take the bypass around. The, the internal combustion engine hadn't been invented. They had to go by feet or donkey, usually by feet. There they go. I'm gonna go talk to God. Back me a lunch. Back me a bunch of meals. Because that's what you'd have to do to go talk to God if you wanted to talk to God. Isn't it easier? the way we get to talk to God today. But that's what happened because he had he took it outside of the camp because of the golden calf. Moses took the tabernacle, pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp. And he called it the tabernacle of the congregation. It came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up. They stood every man in his tent door looked after Moses until he was gone into, into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy, excuse me, the cloudy pillar ascended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people just saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped, every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. Are we going to see Christ like that? Isn't there a beautiful figure of speech when he comes back? No. Wow. Face to face. The Lord spoke unto Moses face to face. Just like we'll see the Lord face to face. Look at that. As a man speaks unto his friend. As a man speaking unto his friend. Do you have to reintroduce yourself to your friend every time you see him? No. Can you get a little intimate with a friend? Sure. Your buds. You get BFF little necklaces and stuff. <laughs> the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. And then Joshua decided to hang around for a little while. And Moses said unto the Lord, you know, look, thou... Uh, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. And they're just, I mean, they're, I mean he's, he's speaking, because this is a time frame of after the golden calf. God's going, I'll just kill them all. That's it. I'll, I'll just start with you again, and we'll start over again. And Moses is going, No, you can't do that. Because all the people will talk, saying that you weren't able to do it, God. And we know you are, but you weren't able to because I had to kill these people. So Moses intercedes for him. But now he comes down in the cloud. You know, the cloud comes down, you know, the pillar of cloud is supposed to follow. It comes over and it air conditions the tent where the two hang out, and it's really nice in the desert there. So that is a, another great way, another different way. God is sure coming up a lot of different ways to talk to his people, take care of his people. So uh, where are we at? We're in 33. Let's go to 34. No, we do, no, we're in 34 now. Let's go to 34, and we'll start in verse 4. 34, 4. 
All right. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning. He climbed Mount Sinai again, as the Lord had commanded him. He took in his hand the two tables of stone, because God told him, I'm not making the tablets this time. You make the tablets, I'll give you what to write on. <laughs> and so, and the Lord descended in the cloud, stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant goodness and truth. You may have heard some of these things in manifestations periodically. Because it's all very true. The Lord descends on a cloud and speaks to Moses. Verse 10. And he said, Behold, I will make a covenant before all the people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all people among whom thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing which I will do with thee. And again, terrible is the same aspect of fear. It's a great, mighty, wonderful that you go, whoa! You're flabbergasted. That's the greatness of what God has here. So, all right. So is God continuing to take care of his people and make himself known? Absolutely. Verse 11, let me see, do I want to do verse 11 in this chapter? No, nah. we just did 4 through 6, right? Yeah. That's good enough. All right, let's jump to, we did 10, let's do 28. 34, 28. And, and, verse th and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights, and he did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant the Ten Commandments. So, Instead of eating, he just communed with the Lord. Didn't have to drink, didn't have to eat. He just got chiseled away. Uh, the Ten Commandments again. Uh, mm -hmm. We're in 34. Let's go to, let's keep reading. 29. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai. He's after 40 days again. He's bringing the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, singular. And he came down from the mount that Moses didn't know that the skin of his face shone white while he talked with them. He came down and he was just glowing. He was just glowing. And he, he, he didn't realize it. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone. And they were afraid to come near him. He's radioactive. <laughs> You've been hanging out three mile island. You know, he's glowing you. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron said, eh, we'll, we'll hang back here. And all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Will we read about this somewhere in Corinthians? About the veil on his face? And when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until they came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. So he would go out with the people. He'd cover his face because he was radiating. He'd go back in, back to God, take it off. Just back and forth, back and forth. All right. Has God shown us a lot of different ways of how he communicated with Moses, how he tried to communicate to his people? Great love, great grace, great mercy, and all these other wonderful things. Yes. Yes. But he doesn't care about us. <laughs> <laughs> We're not in the desert. Well, this, this kind of is a desert. Yeah, it's it's a, desert. Yeah. That's kind of Anyway, um, we're in a city at least. Okay, God will do anything and everything for his people. We just have to continue to communicate and not be afraid that God will work on our behalf. Not send somebody else, you know? to go and talk to God on our behalf, to be able to communicate directly to God and then listen spiritually to what God has to say back for each and every one of us. Because he went out of his way to take care of these people. You can finish up by reading these things in Deuteronomy, all these other records here. Because God continued to work with them. Look at 29, Deuteronomy 29. Look at one more here. Do you mind? No. Oh, no. Deuteronomy 29, verse 1. Alright, 
we're at the end. Moses and the children of Israel have been out there 40 years. Everybody 20 years and older except Joshua and Caleb died. They're just stop and think about that. I mean, there's just two really old people, and Joshua and Caleb, and everybody else is young, way younger than them. Because, you know, they, uh, let me see, when Moses was 80, Joshua was 53. And so Moses is going to die, Aaron's going to die, Miriam's going to die, they're the last of the old generation, they're all going to die in the 40th year in the wilderness. And we only got these two old guys running around. <laughs> and as I taught at the camp last year, Caleb was like, all right, we're going to promise land. I want the land of the giants. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm so sick of being in this desert because of the rest of you people. I don't want anybody else to be afraid. Give me the giants. Caleb had some big kahunas. He was great. Uh, coconuts? Uh, okay. We're in Deuteronomy 29. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab. Beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. And Moses called unto all Israel, and he said unto them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto Pharaoh, and unto his servants, and unto all his land, the great temptations which thy eyes have seen, the signs, and these great miracles. Yet the Lord hath not given you a heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear unto this day. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness, and your clothes are not waxing old up upon you. Your clothes never went out of style. And your shoe is not waxing old upon thy foot. Your Nikes never wore out. You have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink, that you might know that I am the Lord your God. And when you came unto this place, Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Asher, came out against unto the battle. And we smoked them. You may have heard of their relative. His name is Goliath. Goliath was a tad large. These guys were part of the giants. So when they were coming back there, they kicked these giants' butt to show. If you can take these guys out here, you can take them when we get in the promised land. God continues to set them up. And he took their land and gave it for an inheritance unto the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Keep, therefore, the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. Has that verse changed? Should we continue to remember the words of the covenant, to do them, and then will God prosper us by doing His will? He promises that in the New Testament. If we do His will, if we live for Him, He will take care of us. He did it for the children of Israel. He'll do it for His children today. And we, each of us, born again, incorruptible seed, can't lose it. Even if we do go out to the hog country for a while, or in the golden calf country for a while, God's always there with us. It's always tremendous. The next thing God has Moses do is write a song. And Moses writes a song to remember him by. It's one thing after another. So I ask you, did God keep his word? In the short edition of that we've covered, did God keep his word and become whatever he needed to become? Yeah. Will he become what he needs to become on behalf of his children, who are seed children versus servant children, right. adopted right. children? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You are special. Live like you're special as children of the one true God who can, you know, move Pike Speak. That's where I live. Pike Speak right there. He can move mountains if he has to. Yes, it is. <laughs> if he had to throw it in the sea, it's a long way to a sea from there. <laughs> but God will do what he can for his children. And we just need to continue to remember who we are. And it's okay to be God's spoiled children. Why not? I tried to spoil my daughter. I gave her those great looks. <laughs> yeah, that's my mother. But <laughs> the point was is that God will do, we do our best for our children, what will God do for his? So let's pray. Father, thank you for your love, your grace, and for giving us these records that we can see your goodness and how powerful you are, and that we can know that you're at work today on each and every one of our behalf, knowing that you're a God that hears prayers, answers prayers, and goes abundantly above all we can ask or think. We're grateful for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.